Varmt välkomna tillbaka ska ni vara till aktieportföljen live. Vi har två bolag kvar som ska presentera idag och nu har det blivit dags för Saniona och de har jag med mig på länk så jag skickar över ljud och bild till er. Varsågoda. Tack. Uh, oh. Good afternoon everybody. Uh, I'm Jörn Dreyer, the founder of Saniona and chairman of the board uh, and Uh, together with me today, I have uh, Karin S. Nielsen, our new chief scientific officer. You can just have a, a glimpse on her now and, and, and then you can hear her talk later. So for those of you who know Saniona, uh, you also know that we have been through a, a very significant restructuring over the last uh, weeks and it has been really major changes. And, and the, the biggest one is that we closed our US operations. And um, that means that we are again, as we were two years ago before we opened in US, we are again a Scandinavian biopharmaceutical company and also with a cost base that's more common in, in Sweden. Uh, we have, uh, in Denmark, we have uh, uh, reduced our burn by about 75%. So although uh, all this has happened, uh, I can say that uh, our programs have moved very significantly over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, and that goes also for our lead assets, uh, Tesomet, San 7-Eleven, San 903. They have moved forward very, very significantly. But it also goes for our core uh, routes here in Denmark, in Copenhagen, uh, where we have our research platform and our team uh, uh, running uh, all the innovative programs. Uh, this is, has actually been strengthened over the, over the past couple of years. So in the past, uh, though, again, those of you who know Saniona, we have done a lot of partnerships uh, and we'll do that again. So we'll uh, again take down the burn by that and also actually have a, a significant income from that, we assume, as we have had in the past. So we, we also, with this step, uh, should have a, a less dependency on, on the financial market. So we are going for a, a new start now. Uh, it has been... Uh, tough right the, the, the couple of, uh, of, of the last couple of years for our shareholders, in, including Kain and myself. Uh, but we think uh, that uh, with the, the strategy that we have built a strong company around and where we were a couple of years ago, uh, is a really a good basis for getting uh, back to a strong company again. So uh, if we should talk about how we look at the company today, it is still a, a biotech company based in Denmark, listed in Stockholm at the main market, Nasdaq main market. And uh, we have compounds in the clinic, but very much based on our iron channel drug discovery engine, as we call it, which has uh, been over these years, been delivering new uh, programs, uh, new compounds year after year, uh, most of them into partnerships, but uh, a few of them also uh, developed in-house in Sanyona. So one of them is uh, San 903, uh, which uh, we consider a golden egg from from this hen. That has uh, we have actually have the opportunity to develop all the way ourselves. It is a very unique ion channel modulator, which is uh, working on inflammation, but also on fibrosis. And that's uh, the case uh, for in most chronic diseases. You have uh, both inflammation and fibrosis. So it's like a steroid to some extent. Uh, but also working broader than that. So we see very, very broad opportunities there, also in the rare disease space, uh, where we uh, have some very interesting opportunities. We'll not talk much more about SAN 903 today, uh, leave that for another day, because we want to spend most of the time on SAN 711, uh, which is a compound that we are just completing phase one studies on, uh, and it uh, would be a unique a new treatment of opportunity in pain, uh, potentially a, a game changer in pain treatment. Uh, Kain will come and, and talk a lot more about that. And then, of course, there is Tesomet, which is uh, we consider our, our most valuable asset. Uh, and uh, the plan was that we would actually try to go all the way ourselves to do the fine clinical studies and make the commercialization ourselves. We in this. Uh, 
market, we have realized that is not possible. Uh, we cannot raise uh, the kind of money that's needed to, to go for the original plan. So the, uh, the current plan is now to do a partnering and uh, let a partner run the, the, the last piece of the way and then uh, have some significant upside from, from that. But as I said, uh, the value in Tesumate we see as very big and also as uh, certainly not uh, any uh, less than, than uh, before we made this announcement. So a little bit about our drug discovery engine. Um, it's about ion channels, and uh, this is a class of, of uh, drug targets uh, that's been known in the industry for many, many years. It's a, a very uh, huge uh, uh, platform for delivering new new drugs, and most of of the most prescribed drugs today, for instance, within the uh, hypertension field, high blood pressure is uh, from this class and also many CNS drugs and many, many other drugs. But it's only about 20% of the antennas that have been pursued for drug development. And that's mainly because it's very, very difficult. It's very few that masters this. So these antennas, they come in, in many different forms and shapes. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, cl it's clear that you need to uh, address just one specific form of that to have a, a good activity and also have the selectivity. We've been in this field for 20 years and we have made more than 20,000 compounds addressing these different ion channels. And also we have a database of all the data that has been generated on, on these compounds, on these channels. So we are very well positioned to start new programs and also we have already delivered several programs and two in our own pipeline, SAN 711 and 903, which uh, we uh, heard about. Um, so the ion channel drug discovery engine can be described in a cartoon like, like this. It's a, an iterative process running through different disciplines. And here are some of the key people that are driving this process. To the right, you see Janus, who's heading our development. In the middle, uh, you see Pelle, who is uh, uh, the grand old man in iron channels. And to the left, it's actually Kain, uh, our CSO. Uh, I'm... And uh, this has really delivered. I've talked about SANS 11 and 903, uh, which uh, have moved very significantly over the past year. Uh, it has, uh, SANS 711 has gone from uh, into uh, phase one development, and that is completed very soon, and you'll hear more about that. Uh, 903 uh, started preclinical development, and also the last year we've moved it into uh, through that, and, and we can soon announce uh, that this is completed. So two very big milestones uh, just ahead of us. But it's much more than that, and, and most of it ha this has been hidden uh, under the uh, under the water over the, over the past years. But now we'll talk much more about these assets. Uh, we have said to the market that we will select another candidate that's in within epilepsy. Here we call it SAN XXX, and that could happen pretty soon. Uh, also, we have uh, mentioned recently a new program also in epilepsy, in different form of epilepsies, uh, where we are again moving one step further into what we call lead optimization. And all of these programs have a, long, a strong interest uh, between pharma companies uh, and in particular maybe in, in this YYY program. So we also have partnerships. Uh, we have an early one with Boehringer. Also recently we announced that that was taken into uh, the next phase, into hit to lead stage. Uh, and also we have a spin out or a joint venture uh, called Cephagenics in the migraine field. That also is, uh, we, we expect soon to, to move uh, into a new uh, phase shift. So we have done um, several partnerships and, and these two actually uh, funds all uh, one third of our activities in research. And there are more than that. Um, uh, this uh, is just some additional programs, some of them quite advanced that we could put into our pipeline. And you may say, uh, how can a small company like Saniona with a market cap uh, of that size 
move all these programs and that'll cost a lot of money. But but that's not how we see it because we will make partnerships on many, if not most of these uh, programs. Uh, and we've done that in the past as well. I have a little trouble in moving the slides, but I hope it will improve now. Um, so we've done that in the past. We have been actually been in operation now for, for 10 years. And uh, we've generated a lot of revenues from these different partnerships. Uh, I don't have time to go into details with all of them, but we started in 12, 12 with a deal with Janssen, uh, gained 17 million Swedish corner on that. Uh, the program was given back to us due to a strategic shift, and then we later made a deal with Boeing on the same program, and that gave us 111 million Swedish. Uh, and um, that, that is often the case that the strategic dip, uh, changes will uh, give us the compound back and we can make a new agreement. We made a number of spin-outs, Cadent, Scandion, Initiator Pharma, uh, and we have received quite a bit of money on that, and also there are some future upsides from Caden, the uh, Earnhaus Royalties, from Initiator Pharma, we actually gave our uh, shares away to our shareholders as a uh, dividend, and that is perhaps a value of 24 million Swedish today. Scandion, we sold our shares recently, 126 million, uh, and and so on. Uh, maybe I should also just mention Medix, uh, where we took the company Tesofens and gave it to our Mexican partners. They've on phase three development, and now uh, they, it's for registration phase. Uh, so we know they have a meeting with the regulatory authorities in a couple of weeks from now, and we are looking forward to, to hearing progress there. Uh, because here we, we would be looking for, for milestones, uh, for royalties, actually. Um, so currently, uh, we have this deal with, with Boehringer and, and the Cephagenics running. And in total, we've uh, made an income of around 400 million, or close to 400 million Swedish over these years. So we think we can do this again uh, with a new strategy. So now I'll leave the stage to, to Karin to talk more about the SAN 711 compound. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Sandager, and I'm the CSO of the company. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today to share some of the very exciting data that we have generated on SAN 11, our phase one molecule. So just a bit of my background. I'm a biologist by training and I have a PhD in neuropharmacology. And I was also part of the small group of people that started SAN Iona some 10 years ago. At that time, I was responsible for getting us operational and for establishing and managing an animal unit. Later, I took on the role as Senior Vice President for In Vivo and Translational Pharmacology. Prior to San Iona, I was employed at Neurosearch, where I, over the years have held several senior management roles. So I've actually been working together with Jörn and Janus and Padle and a number of other old colleagues for 15 to 20 years by now. So that was just a bit about me. Now I move on to the important stuff, which is, of course, the science. SAN711 is a first-in-class positive allosteric modulator of GABA-alpha-3 receptors. The target indication is neuropathic pain disorders, and it's currently in phase one. Top-line data expected within first half of this year, which, of course, is, is very soon. Next slide, please. So, let me first take a step back and tell you a bit about the mechanisms of pain. I think we need to go one ahead. Yeah, we have a bit of problems with the slides. <laughs> so a bit about the mechanisms of pain firstly. If you, for instance, suffer from painful diabetic neuropathy, where the peripheral nerves have been damaged, the damaged nerves send stimuli that transmits the pain up to the spinal cord. Here, these stimuli activate other neurons that transmits the information up to the brain, up to a part of the cortex called the sensory cortex, where it's finally being perceived as painful. And this transmission is under constant and very tight control by inhibitory neurons. And normally, these neurons make sure that it's only relevant information that is allowed access further up to the brain. And in certain pain conditions, such as neuropathic pain, where the nervous system has been damaged, the inhibitory control system is not working properly. 
and that results in too many pain signals being transmitted to the brain or to an to normal, not painful signals. And of course, the injury result is that signals that would not normally be felt as painful, and that could be a gentle stroke on the hand or the wind in the face, suddenly feels immensely painful. And this that's, of course, very detrimental to everyday life. Next slide. So the mode is to enhance the effect of this endogenous inhibitory system. You can say that it enhances the brain's own inhibitory system, and it does so by enhancing the effect of the neurotransmitter GABA. And GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, and it works by opening up an ion channel. When GABA binds to this ion channel, named the GABA-A receptor, it opens up, and that causes chloride ions to flow in, which results in dampening of neuronal activity. San 7-Eleven binds to another site in the ion channel as compared to GABA, and that allows for it to enhance the effectiveness of GABA. This ion channel, the GABA-A receptor, consists of five parts or five subunits with various subtypes. And normally there's two alphas, two beta, and one gamma subunit. And the function of this receptor complex depends on the identity of the alpha subunit. And it has been shown that when the alpha it Alpha-1 subunit is activated, it results in adverse effects such as sedation, which is drowsiness, motoric instability, and abuse liability, while activation of the alpha-5 subunit has been coupled with cognitive impairment. And all these adverse effects are very well-known uh, effects caused by benzos that binds at the same site. But very importantly, activation of the alpha-3 receptor results in pain relieving effects. And we have capitalized on this knowledge and specifically designed Sense 11 to selectively enhance the effect of GABA at receptors that contain alpha 3 subunit. Next slide. And this slide shows exactly the unique profile of Sense 11. The y axis re represents the GABA activated chloride influx, while the x axis represents increasing concentrations of Sense 11. And what's evident by inspecting this figure is that Sensen 11 only potentiates GABA as effect and cells expressing the alpha-3 receptor, that's the blue line, while there's no or very low effects on cells expressing alpha-1 and alpha-5 receptors, as seen on the red and yellowish line, respectively. And this is a very unique profile, and to the best of our knowledge, it's the only one of its kind. And it's specifically designed to retain all the beneficial effects of enhancing GABA in the spinal cord, while at the same time effectively avoid the adverse effects you get by activating alpha-1 and alpha-5 receptors in the brain. Next slide. So to step back again to this cartoon, SEN711 is anticipated to be pain relieving by enhancing the effect of GABA here specifically at the spinal cord where the abnormal pain signaling is taking place by preventing excessive signaling to the brain. Next slide. And we have produced a lot of data in different animal models that all suggest a strong pain relieving effect. But the data I'll show you here outline some of the core effects of the molecule. And in this study, we have used a rodent model for nerve injury. The y-axis represents the pain threshold, where higher numbers means less painful and vice versa. And the x-axis represents the different phases of the study. Firstly, development of hypersensitivity in the rats is confirmed by a drug-free baseline measurement. And development of hypersensitivity, or allodynia, as it is called, tells us that the rat's nervous system responds exaggerated or abnormally, as the rats now respond to a very low stimulus that the non-nerve lesion rats does not react to, meaning that they have developed neuropathic pain. Hereafter, the rats are treated with increasing doses of sense 11 and the analgesic effect is assists. We also included a group of rats that were treated with morphine as we wanted to have a positive control for tolerance development. And tolerance development means that the effect declines when the medicine is dosed repeatedly and that the dose therefore needs to be increased in order to maintain the pain relieving effect. And that's exactly what is happening with the opioids such as morphine. Then we continue dosing the rats for seven days where after the pain thresholds was, were measured again. And the main conclusions from this study are that acute treatment with sensin 11 and morphine for that matter results in strong and significant allergic effects as evidenced by enhanced pain thresholds on treatment day one. However, and very importantly, 
After seven days of continued treatment, the analgesic effect of Sensen 11 is fully maintained, while the effect of morphine is completely lost. And that's the red arrow that denotes that. And this strongly supports that Sensen 11 is highly effective in an animal model for nerve injury, and that the effect is not lost with repeated treatment. And this critically differentiates Sensen 11 from the opioids. Next slide. So, The previous data slide clearly show that Sensen 11 reduced the pain in rats with neuropathic pain, and that was on a behavioral level. But we also wanted to investigate directly on a cellular level that the mechanism behind this pain relieving effect is due to the ability of Sensen 11 to inhibit or to normalize exaggerated pain signaling in the spinal cord. And for that, we used an ex vivo preparation where the spinal cord is extracted from rats that have been injected with an inflammatory agent. That results in exaggerated pain signaling in the spinal cord, which can be recorded. And this exaggerated signaling is termed wind up. So the top right figure shows the raw data, the actual recordings, where you can see exaggerated neuronal activity under control conditions. It's all these black lines are neuronal activity. And when adding Sensen 11 to the recording chamber, this abnormal signaling is reduced. You can see that all these lines become less dense. So these raw data are summarized in the figure below, showing a very clear and significant dose-related inhibitory effect of Sensen 11 on the wind-up. So these data clearly show that Sensen 11 is able to reduce abnormal neuronal pain transmission in the spinal cord, and that explains on a cellular level the pain-relieving effect in the nerve lesion model. Next slide. So whereas the last two slides have confirmed a very strong analgesic activity of Sensen 11, This slide addresses if this unique subtype selective profile actually is devoid of the adverse effects that is typically associated with GABA-A activated compounds. And one of the dose limiting adverse effects of the non-selective benzos is strong sedation or drowsiness. And sedation in rodents is easily monitored by placing them into a novel environment. And non-sedated rats will happily spend the time actively exploring while rats dosed with, for instance, diazepam, as you can see on the left figure, will explore less as they are sedated. They are sleepy. In contrast to this, the very high doses of SAN711, as you can see on the right-hand figure, fully maintains the ability to actively explore to the same extent as control rats. So these data convincingly show that SAN711 does not lead to the strong sedative effects shared by other GABA-A activators, such as the benzodiazepine. Next slide. So as Jan said, we are currently conducting a phase one study with SAN711, and here the primary objective is to determine the safety and tolerability of the molecule in healthy volunteers. But with this target, we are very fortunate because a pet ligand exists. And that means that we are able to measure to which extent SAN711 is able to displace this PET ligand from the brain in humans. And that gives us the possibility to document that it actually binds to the receptors in the brain that we want it to bind to. So the second objective of this phase one study is to confirm that it reaches its target in the brain and to measure the corresponding plasma concentrations via PET study. So to sum up, SAN711 represents a novel, first-in-class approach. It selectively enhances the effects of GABA on alpha-3 containing receptors. This profile is specifically designed to be ideal for treatments of rare diseases associated with neuropathic pain, and it's devoid of all the typical adverse effects associated with non-selective GABA-A activation. And we do believe, or we have, a very strong preclinical proof of concept in rodent models for neuropathic pain with no indications of tolerance development or sedation. So we are very excited about this molecule and the mechanism, and I'm looking very much forward to being able to share the phase one data with you in the near future. So with this, I think I'll leave it to Jörn again. Yeah, uh, I can see time is, is running out, so I will not uh, spend much time on, on Tesomet, uh, and I think you've also seen the data before. It is very convincing data that we have generated on Tesomet in these two rare Uh, eating disorders, hypothalamic obesity, and Pardavilli syndrome. And also, we've been able to get uh, often doc designation in both of these indications, uh, are ready to move it uh, to the final de development, and, and that will be with a, with a partner. So finally, just uh, uh, 
milestone slide, uh, uh, as we mentioned, since 7 soon data coming out from phase one, we'll complete the 903 uh, preclinical studies. Also, we'll hear from, from Mexico what's going on there on tesofensine, and we will be selecting a new candidate from our iron channel platform. And there'll be a lot, a lot of other news uh, from the uh, iron channel field, as I've indicated. So uh, with that, uh, thank you and uh, ready for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Karin and Jürgen. So as you, um, as I said to you beforehand, we have a lot of questions here from the viewers. So I'm going to get going with those ones. But first, I wanted to know why is the why is it the uh, right decision to make this um, refocus on uh, ion channel drugs instead? Yeah, the idea was that we would actually develop the company from uh, this ion channel company with with early stage assets to a fully integrated company with uh, clinical development all the way to the, to, to market commercialization. Uh, but it's not the right time to do that right now. So we, we see that it's not possible to finance such an ambitious plan. Uh, so therefore, rather than uh, hitting uh, towards the, the wall, uh, we are we are just taking the, the break and are now back uh, where we were two years ago. So we know that uh, strategy works for us and ultimately we would like to go further, uh, but, but this is where we are right now. Going back to the uh, old ways, kind of. <laughs> so yeah. I uh, also, um, let me go through the questions here in the, um, that we got from the viewers. There is someone who wants to know uh, about your thoughts on what value is uh, left in the company now that Tesomet is paused. Yeah, we see the value being exactly the same as it was before. Uh, of course, the value to Sanyona on Tesomet uh, will probably be be smaller, but also the investment be much, much smaller. But we are going for a deal uh, on the compound and, and just having another company develop it. Uh, and, and they should be able to see, uh, of course, the potential and also how far we've gone with, with the compound. So we, we see very significant value for the, the product and also for Sanyona and for the rest of the pipeline that has moved very significantly as well. And that's still all internal values in Sanyona. Thank you. There seems to be um, some worries about the other clinical programs. There are thoughts and worries about whether they will also be paused. What are your thoughts on this, Jürgen and Karin? Yeah, for SAN 7.11, Khan just talked about that we are now completing the phase one study. And in, in the meanwhile, we are also looking for partnerships because this is a big indication, very big potential. And we think this should be best be developed by a, a, a big uh, pharma partner. So, of course, there might be a, a small halt uh, in the development while we are, we are waiting for that. Uh, but we could also do some additional phase one studies uh, to, to look into different pain populations. So there are, there are different opportunities we could do there. For, for 903, uh, as I said, that is uh, being now uh, completing its, its preclinical development. And again, there might be a short delay, but here we actually in, intended to, to develop that ourselves. Uh, so initiate the phase one studies uh, in a more Scandinavian setting with a, with a different budget than we are used to in the US. And there are also questions about the uh, funding. A lot of people are wondering about non-dilutive funding. How are you working towards these goals, like collaborations and soft money injections, etc.? Now, clearly, we, we are we are looking into partnerships with big pharma companies, that, as we have done over and over again in the past. Of course. Uh, during the last two years, we have not done that because we wanted to keep all the, the rights to ourselves. Uh, but uh, again, having a, a, a piece of a, a big cake with a, with a farm partner, that's also a very attractive opportunity. So that is what we'll do. And, and we know everybody in the field, we've done this before. So uh, this is uh, we are on, on the road with the programs and have been then uh, for the last weeks. 
um, like you mentioned, it has been a couple of um, tough months for Saniona and the share price have been sinking. What triggers and uh, value-driven milestones do you think that we can expect in uh, the future to um, regain the trust from the uh, shareholders? Yeah, there are, there are many small milestones uh, uh, in the research platform uh, and 903 uh, um, completing its preclinical development. I think it's actually a, a quite a big uh, milestone when we complete uh, phase one on, on SAN 711 because uh, there'll be a lot of, of, of data with that, uh, uh, which I think will become interesting for, for the market. Um, but of course, the, the, the very big drivers would be if something happened with tesofensin uh, on in Mexico, if uh, we made a deal on, on SAN 711 uh, on Tesomet or, or some of the other programs. So I think that, that, that there are plenty of those that are that could come uh, during the next months, uh, but of course, it, some of them might also take longer time. Would you like to um, spend some time giving us some um, information on what you will be uh, focusing on in the upcoming future? Yeah, uh, as I said, uh, at least I will be doing a lot of business development uh, on the road and Karin will go to the bio conference in, in the US together with another colleague. Uh, so. We have a daily meetings uh, with uh, with different companies that have seen this and are interested in, in looking further into this. So we'll spend a lot of time on on that. But of course, we'll also have most of the organization working on all the other milestones on the programs to complete uh, 903, to complete 711 uh, phase one. Uh, and uh, so there's uh, plenty to do. We'll. We'll not spend time, as we've done a lot in the past, on hunting investors because we don't think it's the right market to do that. Uh, so that will there, there we can save some time, I think. And I just got a question in the uh, live chat now, and it says that it's been widely discussed about the board and management fees that extended over 30 million last year. Any comments on that? Yeah, I would say this is a U.S. standards, but I would say, of course, also it's it's very different from, from Scandinavian standards. And I think that is uh, probably some of the reason for the, the mistrust that has been uh, to San Yona management in the past when it was running from the U.S. Um, and I, I understand that. And, and, and certainly we will we will get away from that. We have Thomas Feltus now as the CEO, and he's uh, very, very uh, concerned about not spending too much. <laughs> so it, it'll be a different time going forward. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the uh, new CEO? Yeah, I think um, many of uh, the San Yonas, uh, sh shareholders know him well because he was actually also a co-founder of San Yona. He worked very closely with me over the past, over the first eight years uh, and he was the CFO of, of San Yona. Then when we moved the company to the US, uh, he decided to leave and uh, so now he's just back and, and in, in, a, in a full uh, uh, senior role with as, as the CEO. There's a question about the, um, they want to know who are RA Capital and why do they sell so many shares? And also if you have any institutions or larger shareholders left that can support the company beside the uh, retail investors. Yeah, I, I can say that uh, when we started in, in the US, we started actually with a a uh, very big financing round, uh, $65 million, uh, a, a lot of money. And, and that came from big institutional investors like RA Capital uh, and, and the like. So some of the, the biggest uh, uh, investors in, in, in the US in the biotech field. But they bought into this story about the, the US company, the US listing, and, and also bringing these uh, products to the market. So I, I do understand that now that we are a different company, uh, and and they, we have not been able to deliver what they came in for. That they are leaving the company again. So so that's fair enough. Uh, so we we have lost m most of our major uh, institutional investors. And again, that's a situation similar to where we were uh, two years ago. And let's um, end uh, today's um, talk a little bit about the um, San 71111. What's uh, next there, Karen? 
well, we are just about, as Jörn said, to finalize the phase one study. And uh, data uh, room has been locked or will be locked here in, in, in June. And after that, we can expect the top line data. And then when we see these data, which we expect will be good, um, then we'll step a, take a step back and consider what we're going to do if our main focus is, of course, to partner it out, as Jörn said. Uh, but depending on the length of that process and, and the financial situation in, in all, we'll, uh, we'll consider what to do after that. Thank you uh, both to Karen and to um, Jürgen for joining me today. And I wish you good luck moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much.